Welcome. Uh, my name is Margarita Clarence. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Duke Journal of Comparative and International Law. And on behalf of the journal, I wanted to welcome everyone um, to our symposium, Public and Private Law in the Global Adjudication System. Um, I particularly wanted to thank our distinguished panelists and moderators uh, for being here today. I'm excited and confident that uh, today's conference will inspire some lively and important debate. Um, I want to thank Professor Michaels and the Center for International and Comparative Law for its indispensable, indispensable financial, intellectual, and moral, and moral support. And lastly, but definitely not least, I'd like to acknowledge Brian Resenzweig, Melanie Jones, um, Kate Gibson, Bo Harvey, and Nate Good, uh, without whom today would not have been possible. So without further ado, I give you Brian Resenzweig. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, there are several other people I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, Kate Gibson and Bo Harvey again uh, for their excellent work in putting together the panel topics and coordinating with our guests. Um, Margarita and Melanie, um, whose leadership really enabled today. Um, and while a lot of students might not ordinar ordinarily know it, there are a group of professionals at Duke who are extremely talented and work hard to make our special events really special. Um, web services, media services, student affairs, and the registrar, thank you all for supporting us. And most importantly, the Center for International and Comparative Law, uh, Naylon Gorel, uh, for really excellent advice throughout the whole process, and Professors Curtis Bradley and Ralph Michaels for inspiring us intellectually and putting us in touch with the great people that we have joining us today. Just a word on the format. In the packet you have in front of you, you'll find a schedule. We're offering four panels. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to present. After the presentations, there'll be 20 to 30 minutes left for questions, and we encourage you all to participate. And the microphones in front of you will be turned on during the question and answer period. I'm particularly excited to welcome you today because this conference marks a change of course for our organization. Several months ago, as a diversion from some of this planning, <laughs> I did some research into the journal's history, and I found that for 18 years, DJCAL has operated as a student-edited law journal devoted to issues of comparative and international law. And for its first nine years, the journal published exclusively in a symposium format, covering a large range of conferences, some of which didn't take place at Duke Law, on a wide range of topics. Since 2000, the journal went to a more typical unsolicited submission format, and since then it's just published two symposium editions, the last in 2002. The concept of returning to our organization's roots, the symposium format, gained momentum last year. Selecting a theme for the Spring 08 edition would allow the journal staff to hone in on an important area and cover it from multiple angles. Today's conference illustrates that while technology enables communication across formerly insurmountable distances, meeting together and in person adds incredible value to scholarly debate. Collaboration promotes creativity, inspires new thought, and educates us all. It is the hope of this editorial board that the journal will continue to select diverse topics to explore through theme symposium editions. I'd now like to welcome Professor Ralph Michaels, our journal's faculty advisor and the president of the center, to the podium. Professor Michaels will give an introduction to the subject of today's discussions. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. I'm, um, I'm a director of the center. I'm not a president of the center, but this year we think president all the time. So <laughs> I'm, not, um, I'm not electable. I'm, a, I'm an alien. Uh, <laughs> Welcome everyone, my name is Ralph Michaels, and I do come here in three roles indeed. The first one is, in one sense, the most pleasant one. I'm the director of the Duke Law Center for International and Comparative Law. That's very pleasant in part because you run a budget, you give away money that's not yours, but people thank you for it as though it were your own money. <laughs> um, that's one of my jobs. The center was established in 2006 under the inaugural um, directorship of Kurt Bradley. And it provides an umbrella for all things international and comparative at Duke, and it also operates as an organizer of talks and conferences and fellowships and all kinds of other things that we can think about in the coming years. And obviously, it adds visibility, we think, to international and comparative law at Duke. 
Uh, we've always thought we do a lot of international and comparative law at Duke, and we're doing very well. And the center is certainly helping us do this and also helping to um, streamline and make that visible. And we will establish a uh, listserv fairly soon, and uh, even without your agreement, we'll put you all on it. <laughs> My second role here is that of an advisor of the journal. That's an even more pleasant job because you don't have to do very much because the journal does such a good job um, in and by itself. Uh, the journal has put together this conference. It's true that uh, Kurt Bradley and I, or Kurt, I think, in the uh, start suggested to go back to a symposium format, at least of, for one of those um, two issues that they publish. And, they, uh, and we suggested some ideas for panels and um, panelists, and then essentially the journal does what the journal does very well and organized this conference and brought all of this together and reminded me at some point that I was supposed to give some introductory remarks. So that's really what I'm doing here. And that's the third role that I have. And I'm very, very happy about that role because this is a topic that really interests me um, very much. And it's in this third role that I will shamelessly abuse this privilege of giving opening remarks because it enables me to formulate the topic as I see it and it enables me to put three general questions to the panelists, and I ask for you all to submit your answers to me by the end of the conference. <laughs> the subject, the public and private law in the global adjudication system should be a non-subject, because the public-private distinction, as we all know, is dead. Legal realism taught us long ago that private law is really public law. Property and contract are not truly private institutions. They are mere expansions of state sovereignty. Private law performs public functions of the state, and is administered by public institutions, namely the courts of the state. Most private law scholars today will discuss their fields with public functions in mind, economic efficiency, social welfare maximization, deterrence of socially undesirable conduct, etc. This idea that the public-private distinction is dead has a blind spot, and the blind spot is the state. Property can be an expansion of state sovereignty only within the state and its legal system. Court enforcement makes private law public only if the courts doing the enforcement are public. Take away the state and its judicial system as the perspective, the framework that you use, and the idea of the collapse of the distinction loses its, loses its grounding. The public-private distinction may be dead within the state, but this may mean little once we move beyond the state into the transnational realm, into the global adjudication system, as Charles Brower described it in a presentation he gave here last year. Now, at least in one way, the distinction is alive and well, and that is with regard to the fact that public and private international law rarely talk to each other. Public international lawyers focus on the relations between sovereign states. When they look to private actors, their question is whether these actors can be viewed as subjects of international law, not whether they threaten the essentially public character of public international law altogether. When they speak about human rights, they think of the relation between states and individuals, not of that between individuals. Private transactions are by and large not an issue for public international law. Private international lawyers, by contrast, are aware or are made aware of the significant impact that public international law has on their field, especially through treaties and through doctrines like sovereign immunities, the act of state doctrine, and others. In fact, international conflict of laws is sometimes thought of as part of public international law altogether. But private international lawyers, by and large, do not care much about those debates in public international law that have no immediate impact on them. International courts and customary international law largely seem irrelevant to them. Now, the panels at this conference are so fascinating, to me at least, because they aim at combining these separate discourses. They try deliberately to put private and public international lawyers on, um, on one and the same panels. That helps us go beyond the somewhat trite insight that public and private international law somehow overlap and somehow mutually influence each other. Instead, I think three questions emerge and my biggest hope for the conference is that we will get some answers to these questions. The first question you could say is an educational one. What can public and private international law learn from each other? Where do we have parallel debates in public and private international law that should be linked? To what extent are experiences made in one field fruitful to the other? This is something we find addressed in all panels. Take the question on the third panel, private arbitral decisions and international court judgments. Decisions by arbitral tribunals are regularly enforced in domestic law. Decisions of public international courts, by contrast, receive merely, quote, respectful consideration, unquote. Is this consistent? Does it help to say one is private and the other is public? Given that US courts will even enforce arbitral awards 
that deal with U.S. public international law, the like antitrust law, the Mitsubishi case. Or the questions of the fourth panel, acceptance and enforcement of private and public international law. We regularly enforce foreign private law through conflict of laws, but we hesitate with regard to foreign and international public law. Is this justified in view of the alleged collapse of the public-private distinction? Can the current debate on the role of public international law and domestic law learn from the debate in choice of law, some 70 years old, on the role of foreign law in domestic proceedings? And the question addressed in the first panel, especially concerning the role of custom in public and private international law, brings together two discourses that are surprisingly separate. Public international law currently observes a hot debate about customary international law. Does it exist at all? If so, is it law? What are its sources, especially what is the role of state consent versus actual practice? And if we look to practice, where do we find it? In texts and official pronouncements or in actual conduct of states? If, is customary international law legitimate as opposed to law formally sanctioned by the state? And what is its role in domestic courts? The private international lawyer observing these, this debate feels a certain déjà vu. We've had this debate in private international law some 40 years ago with regard to customary private international law in form of the Lex Mercatoria, the alleged customary law of international commerce. And all the questions asked to customary international law today have been asked from Lex Mercatoria some years ago. Does Lex Mercatoria even exist outside the heads of some French professors who proclaim it? Is Lex Mercatoria, it's funny how whenever you say French in America, people laugh. <laughs> Really, it's really a very easy joke. <laughs> is Lex Mercatoria actually law, or is it merely custom? Are its sources in state law, or are they in commercial practices? And if they are in practices, same debate as before, can we find it in texts, most notably the Unidra principles of international and commercial contracts? Or do we have to look to the actual conduct that goes on in commerce? Is Lex Mercatoria legitimate, given that it is not established in democratic procedures? And what is the role of Lex Mercatoria in domestic courts, especially can it be applied under a choice of law analysis? Now, these are parallel questions. That does not mean they require similar answers in public and in private international law. But what it means is it suggests that we should look to whether we have these parallels and whether the different discourses can learn from each other. The second question is practical. It concerns the mutual substitutability of public and private international law and institutions. Can public and private international law, public and private adjudicatory bodies perform similar functions? Can they uh, perform as functional equivalents? And if so, which of them is preferable for any given um, situation? That's an inside joke when I say functional equivalents, then people in my comparative law class smile because I say that all the time. Thanks for uh, realizing that. <laughs> um, that's an issue especially addressed in the second panel that compares court and adjudication. Uh, and arbitration. Quite ironically, of course, private law was long adjudicated by public bodies, public courts, whereas public international law usually found its way into quasi-private arbitration. Only recently have we seen a shift in both of those. Private law goes to private arbitration, public international law to public international courts, but there's nothing essentially necessary about that. Public and private adjudication stand in the most obvious competition for areas that transcend public and private from the start the most obvious example being investment disputes. Some investors go to domestic courts to bring suits against defaulting sovereigns, for example, Argentina, on the base of choice of court agreements and waivers of sovereign immunity. Others use arbitration to bring essentially the same claims. Is one of them more appropriate than the other? Should we worry that arbitrators might give too little deference to state sovereignty? Or might, in fact, the, op the opposite be true? It seems that in the investment context, at least occasionally, arbitrators are more willing to give deference to state sovereignty than our public courts. And this competition is not confined to adjudicatory bodies. It also goes to applicable law. If Argentina claims an ability to pay, the um, question becomes relevant whether this is a public international law claim or a private claim. As a public sovereign, Argentina might well argue that it's sovereign and can determine what to do with its money. As a private debtor, the argument to say, I don't have the money or I'm not willing to pay, does not get you very far. So um, the question whether we use public international law or private international law to deal with these aspects actually becomes crucial also for the way in which we, we look for answers. And those may not be, that, that may not be an easy 
decision. We may want to say, as I, say, as I think some people will say later, that if the problems at stake are mostly political, they belong to international courts. If they are largely commercial, they should go to arbitration. But arguably, investment disputes are essentially both. They're essentially commercial and they're essentially um, political. Can we substitute one for the other? Are public and private international law functionally equivalent? And how else do we decide between the two? A third set of questions, finally, is theoretical. And here I come back to the beginning of what I remarked today. The, the role of the public-private distinction on the international sphere. Is the distinction dead here as well? And if not, what are its specificities? How does it play out? The third and the fourth panel address these questions, but really, again, they transcend all panels. One view would be to either ignore or deny the insights from the domestic question and maintain that, at least on the international sphere, public and private are essentially different. Arbitration is essentially private and consensual, and thus raises no great issues of legitimacy or of enforcement. Public international law, by contrast, is highly political and therefore problematic. Or again, if the problems at stake are political, they belong into international, public international law. If they're largely commercial, they belong into um, private international law. That could be true, although that rehashes some of the debate we had in the domestic system. Another view would directly translate the insights from the domestic sphere into the international sphere. If the public-private divide is dead domestically, then maybe we should also proclaim it dead on the international sphere, and we should treat arbitral tribunals and international law and public, and public international courts, we should treat private law and public law internationally exactly the same. Maybe we should enforce arbitral awards and public international court decisions the same way. Maybe we should enforce foreign public law in conflict of laws in the same way in which we traditionally enforce foreign private law, as Bill is going to argue later. And a third possibility is that the public-private distinction exists, but in a way different from that in the domestic sphere. In fact, it's not even exactly clear what the public and what the private would be on the international sphere. Are states representatives of common public interests, or are they individual actors with specific interests engaging in essentially private relations with other states? Is contract, private contract, still an expansion of sovereignty, or is sovereignty now an expansion of private contract? If the state's competence to adjudicate and regulate is based on a choice of law and a choice of court agreement by private parties. And if states, in order to receive credit, must contract out their sovereign rights and essentially turn themselves into private actors. If this were so, then the global adjudication system looks importantly different from the domestic system. And it is high time to start understanding how exactly it works out. So, education, what are parallels between the debates in public and private? Practice, to what extent can we substitute one set of norms for the other? Theory, in what way are public and private distinct or similar on the transnational sphere? These are no easy questions, and the fact that they have rarely been asked as such so far does not make it easier to respond to them. Or if this conference brings us closer to understanding them, it will be a huge success, definitely for me, because these are my questions, but I hope, <laughs> I hope also for you. I, I'm very glad that the journal put this together. I'm glad that this amazing set of panelists came. Almost no one said no to this. I'm really looking forward to what we're going to learn. I apologize, I have to go at parts to um, perform my day job, which is be a teacher. Um, but I am sure I'll learn a lot from this. So thank you very much. And we begin, I think, with the first panel. Introduction. Let me just add one thing. To moderate our first panel, uh, please welcome Deborah A. DeMott, David F. Cavers, professor here at Duke. Professor DeMott has published extensively in the fields of corporate law, takeovers, and fiduciary obligation, and recently served as the ALI's reporter for the Restatement Third on Agency. I'm happy to introduce Demott, Professor DeMott, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Good morning. And in turn, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, uh, first two panelists. It's my understanding that each will speak for about 20 minutes, and then there will be um, quest obviously opportunity for questions and comments, and I will moderate this. Um, uh, professor uh, J. Patrick Kelly uh, is a professor at Widener Law School. Uh, he joined the faculty in 1984. Uh, uh, following um, uh, governmental service and service overseas. 
Uh, he's been the founder and director of the Nairobi International Law Institute um, and director of the Sydney International Law Institute. Um, the focus of his um, talk will be um, um, uh, naturalism uh, in international adjudication. Um, we'll, secondly, we'll hear from uh, Professor Jan Dalhausen, who is a professor at King's College um, School of Law in London. Uh, most immediately, however, Professor Dalhausen comes to us from the University of California at Berkeley, where he is a regular visitor. Um, before joining the King's faculty, he was a senior investment banker, uh, secretary general of the International Primary Market Association, and a senior in-house counsel. And his talk will focus on the revival of custom uh, in public international law. Very good. Thank you. Good morning. First off, I want to thank uh, the members of the review for inviting me and for doing the wonderful logistic work that's happened so far. Uh, Margarita, Kate, Brian, Nathan, Melanie, all of you have done an outstanding job, and we, I'm sure all of us appreciate that. Uh, I also want to uh, thank my colleagues uh, already because I look forward to hearing your answers to those questions. I certainly can't answer them, and I'm hoping some of you could help me out on that. Uh, this morning, I'm talking about naturalism in international adjudication. The existential problem of international law is well known. Uh, there's a lack of a legislature to make law, an executive to um, carry out the law, a, a court of mandatory jurisdiction to articulate what the norms are. Under conventional international legal theory, international law is consensual. Uh, express consent in the case of treaties and implied consent in the, pace, in the case of customary international law. In my view, international and domestic adjudicative bodies are increasingly turning away from consent and towards naturalism in lawmaking. This trend towards naturalism rather than um, consensual norms is undermining essential values to the international sphere, such as democratic legitimacy, uh, faithfulness in treaty interpretation, national sovereignty, and respect for local regulatory regimes and culture. This rise of naturalism is not accidental. It reflects an underlying value struggle in the domestic polities of the advanced developed countries. And we might characterize this um, struggle as into two different visions. One is the progressive internationalists, and the other is state power rationalists. Progressives are uh, concerned about globalization, the pressure for efficiency, and regulatory competition that has reduced the power of the state to implement social welfare legislation. They would use the various forms of law to elevate these regulatory concerns of advanced wealthy nations to the international level. This view would international, internationalize, for example, domestic constitutional norms of secular individualistic societies as universal human rights. This view idealizes international law as restraints on state power and limits on trans transnational corporate behavior. State power rationalists see the same trends, but they are concerned about the reduction of state sovereignty inherent in globalization. They view, view states as atomized individuals operating in an anarchic world. They idealize state power and see law as an instrumental mechanism to achieve their substantive values. For them, international law is facilitative, not restraining. Both positions mirror the classical tension in international law between being both a reflection of Western culture and an imperial project to universalize law, regardless of participation or assent. National is naturalism is useful to each perspective because it bypasses more democratic processes when success in policy is unlikely. The moral crusade, for example, of Western universalism exhibited by the Bush administration's war for democracy in Iraq shares much with human rights universalist mission. Both are forms of naturalism bypassing, bypassing positive law in pursuit of their vision of the good. Premature international legalism in calling norms rights takes normative development and trade-offs out of the realm of international and domestic politics. 
I briefly want to discuss three different forms of naturalism. The, muse, the misuse of customary international law, creative interpretation of treaty norms, and an emerging ideology of human rights beyond state consent. The three central themes I think are going to emerge from this. The uh, democratic legitimacy of norms, the unresolved conflicts of values and interests finessed by naturalism, which is relevant to our discussion of private international law, I think. Uh, and finally, the inadequacy of international lawmaking processes. Turning first to customary international law. Customary international law is said to be consensual based on state practice generally accepted. Uh, states impliedly consent to these norms by their participation in state practice and their demonstrated attitude of acceptance. Customary law, properly so-called, is empirical law. Customer, that is, customary norms are binding because, in fact, they are accepted by all normal members of a society. Notice empirical acceptance is the touchstone. It's necessary both for legality and for legitimacy of customary norms. Uh, mandatory customary practices are found in all societies. In traditional so societies, for example, they are considered, long-standing practices are considered binding, and they're enforced through embarrassment, shunning, and uh, exclusion of someone from their society, which may result in death. Customary international law, has, however, has developed on a very different path. Rather than accepted law observable in practice, much of customary international law is articulated by scholars, by non-governmental organizations, and international jurists. Custom, then, is deduced from fundamental principles rather than being induced from actual practice. The problem with using this concept of law in the international, public international sphere is that nations have widely different histories, values, and interests. That is, in traditional societies, you're dealing with homogenous societies where people have basically long histories and shared values. In the international sphere, you have heterogeneity with the essential requirement of general acceptance, both unlikely and difficult to determine. Some of the, the problems with applying this concept of law to the international sphere I actually have been raised in the questions by P Professor Michaels. Um, first, since few nations actually participate in the limited acts of state practice, generalizations about that are suspect and often inaccurate. Second, there is no agreement on what constitutes state practice. Does um, a physical act only count as state practice, or are statements also state practice? Third, how do we know if a norm has been generally accepted? Are agreement or assent to declarations at international conferences or the United Nations General Assembly? Does that count, constitute acceptance, or is it just a concern about a vague goal? Fourth, what is the source of customary international law's obligation? Is it common consent? that is, a consensus of states, or is it specific consent, either implied or expressed? The me uh, methodology of customary international law is undefined and so malleable that both the left and right portions of the political spectrum have little difficulty in manipulating its elements to achieve the norms they seek. Progressive internationalists, including leading judges on the International Court of Justice, the World Trade Organization, and the European Court of Human Rights, utilize general resolution and treaties to promote environmental and human rights norms. On the right, scholars and unilateralists operating under theory that only physical acts count use custom theory to promote rules to protect foreign investment and to promote a right of unilateral intervention, humanitarian or otherwise. Uh, to, let me just talk briefly about the, the declarative model the progressive views. They use it to construct particularly environmental norms such as sustainable development, precautionary principle, or the transboundary harm norm. But these are not really norms accepted by states. The arbitrator in the trail smelter case, for example, found no evidence of international state practice. Rather, he chose to assume that international law of transboundary air pollution was the same as U.S. law and then applied U.S. law. The Stockholm Declaration and the subsequent Rio Declaration, which might be seen as reinforcing this transboundary harm norm, also contain contradictory language declaring the states have the sovereign right to exploit the resources according to their own environmental and development policies. Indeed, there's little empirical evidence that states accept this norm. The trail smelter in Canada still spews carbon dioxide into the air. 
the United States produces acid rain that drifts across into Canada. By what authority does the transboundary harm norm leap from a declaration to a binding norm? Similarly, the uni universalizing of limited incidents of state practice in powerful nations promotes power at the expense of democratic legitimacy. A few incidents of highly contested state practice, such as the US invasions of Panama and Grenada, are treated as new exceptions to general norms despite widespread protest. The New Haven School, for example, substitutes the self-interested judgment of a few on policy for law. Consider that there is a class of customary international norms that do actually exhibit regularity of behavior and are asserted by nearly all nations as legally required. The list, while relatively a short one, is a journey through our civilization's painful attempt to confront its own inhumanity. The prohibitions against genocide, slavery, ethnic cleansing, torture, and now arguably the juvenile death penalty are universally accepted as law violations. Nations do not argue that torture is not a binding prohibition, but rather that a particular practice is not torture. If much of custom scholarship promises too little through premature legalism, the new rational self-interest school promises too little. Uh, professors Goldsmith and um, Posner challenged the classical view of international lawmaking. They argue that custom is better explained by rational self-interest than fidelity to legal obligation. Their descriptive accounts of rational self-interest is then used to support their normative project of eliminating legal restraints on state behavior. All of these approaches to customary international law have some rev resonance because there's little agreement on how to construct customary international law. Much of custom is naturalism, not empirical law. In my view, creative approaches to custom are not necessary in our era of rapid communications and transportation. If there is, in fact, the political will to accept these as uh, binding legal norms, then one would expect uh, treaties, binding treaties are possible. If there is not the political will, then perhaps the imperial project of universal, universalizing European culture is recast with little understanding of some of the implications. Customary international law may be the preferred t technique for normative scholars and judges precisely because there are unresolved conflicts over values that cannot be bridged. Turning to a second form, which is naturalism in uh, world trade organization adjudication, um, as you know, the WTO was uh, founded in 1995, inaugurated a new era of compulsory adjudication with sanctions uh, for the losing party. This, of course, creates the opportunity for judges to make law. The debate at the WTO, has, however, has been between those who are essentially uh, promoting a contractual view of that regime and those who would take other norms, customary norms and treaty norms, uh, to infuse other values into the um, WTO. At a formal level, ex extrinsic norms um, have not been used to add new norms to the WTO. Um, the appellate body, for example, in the European beef hormone case, found that the precautionary principle cannot be used in a manner that uh, gave a justification for a ban on uh, imported products. But um, naturalists have been more successful in using ex extrinsic norms, extrinsic norms such as custom and outside treaty norms, in interpreting what WTO terms mean. Uh, the limits of consent, I think, have been tested in a series of in, uh, environmental cases, conservation cases, um, involving the U.S. Marine Mammal Protection Act. And many of you, I'm sure, are quite familiar with these, from tuna dolphin to the shrimp sea turtle case. They involve two different uh, types of exceptions to the norms at the WTO. The first is the health and safety exception for measures necessary to protect human, animal, or plant life or health. And the second is the conservation exception for uh, relating to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. In the shrimp sea turtle case, the appellate body found that uh, living creatures were now exhaustible natural resources under the conservation exception. 
In making the, reaching this conclusion, they do not try to determine the meaning of the text at the time, nor do they try to determine the intent of negotiators. Instead, what they did is they announced an evolutionary methodology and said that um, under this methodology, the meaning of exhaustible had to be determined in light of contemporary concerns of the international community rather than necessarily what the meaning of the uh, agreement was at the time. Um, the argument is that, at least my argument is that uh, there's considerable evidence at the time that what was meant by natural re resources was inanimate minerals and commodities which were finite and exhaustible, while living creatures could reproduce and they were protected under Article 20B for human, animal, or plant life or health. While the goal of preserving threatened species is an important one that I share, the United States was unilaterally using the, level, the lever of market access to prescribe environmental policy within Thailand. So let me just summarize some of my core concerns. First, uh, the evolutionary met methodology itself is inconsistent with a consensual state-based structure of governance at the WTO. It's inconsistent with the interpretive methodology that's required under the dispute settlement understanding. Second, I think the proper interpretation of exhaustible natural resources does not include living creatures which are protected under the health exception. Third, and I think most importantly, nearly all nations, including the United States and the European Union, opposed a broad exemption and had voted at the Uruguay round to move a similar proposal to the Committee on Trade and Environment where they hoped it would die a natural death because they didn't want to open up the possibility that it could be used for protectionist purposes and deny them access to other markets. This evolutionary methodology, I think, candidly, is really a um, naturalist methodology. Now important policy decisions on the appropriate balance of environmental protection and economic development are left to each nation. They're left to the vagaries of interest group politics in the domestic political arena of each nation. Uh, turning finally to human rights as naturalism. There's a third form of naturalism that's actually embedded in human rights theory. It's the idea that uh, human rights are an expression of universal rights that apply regardless of national boundaries or political choice. Sometimes this argument is made as a form of customary international law. Sometimes it's a claim uh, that in, in, that's used in a manner of interpreting a treaty. Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights includes a prohibition on cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punish, punishment. Tribunals have used this rather vague norm to prohibit the death penalty, caning, other forms of physical punishment, even though these punishments are widely permitted within domestic legal systems. In the case of death penalty, for example, there, you could, probably could not find even a majority of nations that would accept that as a limit on their prerogatives. Um, what a given society determines as cruel or inhuman may actually be a matter of perception and affected by culture and religious beliefs. Uh, similarly, Article I of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms and Discrimination Against Women, which is a major advance for women's rights, prohibits discrimination that is the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise of human rights by women. I know I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but I'm going right ahead. The, the committee that supervises compliance declared that female circumcision or female genital mutilation was a gender-based form of violence and that st uh, states may be responsible even for private acts if they fail to act with due diligence. Now, obviously, female genital mutilation is abhorrent and a significant health risk. It's not clear, however, that it's a form of discrimination that violates the convention when participants, which are primarily women and young girls, believe that the traditional practice is a constituent part of their culture. Nor is it necessarily either a treaty or a customary norm when 53 nations that signed on to that agreement entered reservations for religious or cultural reasons. These techniques of universalizing rights beyond politics, of course, are not just the uh, province of progressives. The restatement of foreign relations law, for example, proclaims the standard of full compensation for expropriation as a universal and 
um, norm and not subject to change by a majority of nations. The Bush administration, for exa example, asserts a right to democracy as a justification for the selective military intervention to vindicate this right. The, the point here is not to disapprove or approve of the death penalty, female genital mutilation, the right to democracy, or any specific norm, but to raise the issue of which uh, level of law, international or domestic, should be addressing these concerns and by what processes. The universal theory of human rights applied by many judges and practitioners is obviously inconsistent with the consent, consent theory of international law. Indeed, it precludes pluralism in norm development. In Kenya, for example, where I, I've spent a great deal of time, there is a very strong uh, women's movement that's transforming that society. And it's led to a series of democratic reforms and also to a law prohibiting female genital mutilation. But there are significant societal pressures that make it very difficult to enforce that law, even a domestic law. Imagine the effectiveness of an edict from an international committee with no enforcement power or leverage. Expanding human rights contrary to non-Western cultural values raises issues of legitimacy of the project and its practical utility when it engenders widespread opposition rather than respect. Differences in values in many circumstances might better be characterized as a moral dialogue rather than a legal imperative. In labeling, tra in labeling traditional practices as illegal rather than a moral issue within a specific sp social context shuts down dialogue. Uh, the female genital mutilation debate, for example, is conflating two things, harm, which is quite significant, with ritual. A more pluralistic and, I think, modest approach might encourage an evolution away from the harmful parts of these practices and towards a more symbolic ritual. Uh, finally, in, in conclusion, uh, the basic thrust of what I've been saying is the link between state consent and international norm development is increasingly attenuated. All forms of naturalism, naturalism that I've discussed, the misuse of customary international law, the adoption of a universal ideology, uh, the expansive or evolutionary interpretation of a treaty, diminish democratic decision making in politics. Democratic values will be enhanced by decreasing reliance on custom as a legitimate source of substantive legal norms. Few substantive customary international laws have a legitimate pedigree as law. The legitimacy of international law would be enhanced by greater use of consensual treaties and treaty regimes. Treaty regimes, as a general matter, permit greater participation, more efficient solutions, and a level of commitment to norms. Treaty regimes permit a wide variety of policy tools and outcomes. There is a nation framework of policy instruments, both domestically and international, to expand economic opportunity through microcredits and other means to release the initiative and dynamism of local people. In the US, as a matter of fiscal necessity, there's been a rise in market-based environmental policies, such as the cap and trade system that stimulates innovation and encourages efficient production. The substantive values of democracy, individual rights, and secularism are Western in origin and may have limited resonance in many societies. Litigation to impose universal solutions and problems may not be the best way to improve a situation. Example I want to use here is the South African government is being, has strenuously objected to Alien Tort Claim Act suits in the in US against firms doing business with South Africa during apartheid. The independent government of South Africa views such suits as an interference with its domestic process of reconciliation and contrary to their sovereignty. Let me just conclude by saying that international law historically has been a means of domination. Treaty regimes have the capacity to be a mechanism for cooperation and the resolution of values through greater respect for other perspectives. Thank you very much. I, I wonder whether I can do it from here uh, in face of this posse of interrogators, and you have no idea how threatening this is. <laughs> Let me see what I can remember of my paper, uh, proceeding on the basis that what cannot be remembered is not worth saying. Right. Can, can you hear me? Does this? 
Ah, okay. All right. Now, if we step back a little, or let me say something else. The, uh, when I was first asked to do this, uh, the uh, journal wrote to me and said, well, um, we understand that there is a problem with uh, custom in international law, in public international law, but uh, it is much easier in private law, and will you please explain that? Now, uh, it is just <laughs> as difficult, just as difficult, for exactly the same reason uh, in a transnational private law, as I will explain. Now, if we go back 200 years at the start of the age of modernity, and we look around uh, Europe, which was then the center of the world, we'll find that, in fact, all law is customary. All. The whole idea that custom and law could be different is a, a concept which would be uh, unthinkable or un, 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 um, unreal to the people of those days. Law is imminent. You have some legislation, but it is rare. If we look at the common law, the common law is said to be uh, of immemorial times, of immemorial usage. Uh, the uh, common law courts find the law. They do not make it. There is an other layer of customary law, that is the commercial law. The commercial law is independent from the common law. Uh, it is found in the staple courts, in local fairs. And there is indeed a statute, I think, at the Carta Mercatoria of 1385, which recognizes the independent source of law of the uh, merchant law of those days. Uh, it is, however, considered to be of a lower rank. And uh, you will see that in the 18th century, the common law indeed gets a step at that kind of merchant law. Uh, the uh, jealousy of the courts at Westminster, especially the Court of Admiralty, uh, declares these uh, uh, commercial courts and their laws uh, licensed courts. Uh, they, uh, in their view, not Justice Cook, uh, the um, domestic uh, commercial laws and courts, they operate uh, by license of the common law, and then you will see that the common law takes uh, the law merchant inside and uh, will not allow the um, uh, old-fashioned independent courts uh, the local courts to continue to operate. Now, and then we get the problem, what is commercial uh, law and what is commercial custom within the common law, and that is the problem of uh, Lord Mansfield. And uh, Lord Mansfield tries to retrieve some of this within the common law and tries to formulate usage and custom within the common law, starts to uh, um, uh, reformulate uh, the uh, uh, promissory notes, the um, bills of lading, uh, the SIF contract and the FOB contract a little later within the common law, um, but it is, uh, it becomes more problematic, uh, but it is not yet an issue of the state. It is the common law courts in their independence, they push out the commercial law or in fact they, um, they bring it in, uh, they, uh, they, they start to formulate it, uh, they start to monopolize it, um, and its role becomes a little more difficult, but it is still there. Of course, as I teach my students, the Americans are so comfortably old-fashioned <laughs> because the, unexpectedly, because the commercial code, as you well know, in Article 1103 makes it very clear that the commercial law is not in the common law, that it stays apart, and uh, it uh, makes room for it. It says very clearly, uh, that uh, the commercial law is liberally interpreted in order to allow for custom and usage and also for the common law equity and for the law merchant. Uh, that is or was lost even then already in the common law. Now, uh, of, of, in England. Now, if we go to the continent, we find an, uh, a different picture um, because there are many more countries, and, uh, but there again, it is, in essence, customary. Everything is customary. The um, Roman law is the overarching law. It is the universal law, it, uh, later explained as the rational law. 
in which all comes together, but of course it was never promulgated. It was received, it was accepted to be the superior law, but it had no uh, a, a root in a statist pro pronouncement or uh, a, a statute, not at all. Uh, you also have commercial law besides this. Uh, that is more local. Uh, you have city laws, you have the statuta in the uh, northern Italian cities. You have the city laws of Amsterdam, of Antwerp, uh, Lübeck in uh, no no northern Germany. Um, but uh, these laws operate besides the Roman law, uh, but they are narrowly interpreted in order to give the Roman law as much uh, uh, a space as possible. It's true that in France it was different, uh, as always, even then, uh, and that is in a footnote of my paper somewhere. Uh, but the general idea in Germany and Italy was that the Roman law superior, uh, su but again, superior usage. Now, the problem starts at the end of the 18th century also there, uh, because uh, what is in this realm of universal law really the uh, role of the state? Uh, what is uh, the role of public policy? And um, uh, you see that already in the works of Grotius, uh, there is tension there. Uh, th there is an, an inclination to uh, a more domestic approach, a national approach uh, to uh, the formation of law uh, in as far as nations became operative in those days in the modern sense. And um, if you, but if you see, if you look at the discussions in France uh, of the Enlightenment in the, 19th, in, the, in the 18th century, you, you see that uh, Condorcet and uh, also Diderot in his famous paper on natural law, where he copies in fact uh, Grotius, uh, that the law in the School of Enlightenment, also in France, continues to be perceived as universal. Uh, its values are universal, of course in natural law you do not have only Roman law, you have also this very close relationship to morality and a fundamental principle, but it remains a, a universal thing and um, it is for everybody. Uh, it is for states and it is for individuals exactly the same. That's of course the whole idea of Grotius. And, um, but you see the term, even in the discussions there, uh, of course it starts with Rousseau, that uh, in the end uh, it is a social contract it is the state, it is uh, the state certainly as the best enunciator of all of this, and um, it becomes policy, and then you get the Republic of Virtue of Robespierre, in which the state is all, the individual is nothing, it is all policy. And that is a romantic idea, that is the, of course, that is the romantic school. It is not very romantic in the sense, but I mean, <laughs> uh, that is the way it is, and you see at the same time, you see that in the writings of Fichte, and then in Germany you see it, uh, of course, Hegel in his Principles of the Philosophy of Law in, of 1821 enunciates that, in fact, the state is the only one who can um, uh, formulate the law and um, uh, no one else. It is the state prerogative because the state in the uh, inevitable course of history is the only actor and uh, it has therefore also the autonomy in matters of law formation. And uh, of course the Germans have an extra layer in uh, the, Rolf knows it better than I, in the 19th century, uh, they um, superimpose on this the whole idea that the private law is a system, that it is an intellectual system, that it is academic, and that it is nothing outside that system, and it is made. Now, in that environment there is no room for custom. Custom is ignored. A custom becomes a license. A custom only operates where the given law allows it to operate, especially in interpretation of contract. Um, and then <coughs> for the rest, it is, it's not denied that it might not exist, but it becomes atavistic. Uh, it is said that it is, you know, it's tribal. Uh, it may still be here and there, but it shouldn't be. It is not modern. Uh, for commerce, it cannot quite be denied, but there we make the law or the custom an implied contract condition at best, so that basically a uh, custom becomes contractual. And that is really, I think, where we are. 
when we get into the 20th century, or even the middle of the 20th century, uh, of course, in retrospect, it is often confused with the democratic idea that uh, this was a democratic idea of formulating the law through the modern state. Of course, we must not forget that there was nothing democratic in Europe very much in the 19th century. I mean, if the truth is being said, democracy took hold in Europe only after the Second World War, except for one or two countries. And many were not, and all the others were struggling. So um, uh, the idea that the, the German code, for example, and the French code were product of democratic uh, uh, procedures, well, it is ridiculous. So the, it was a product of a state, but it's not the same. No. So uh, that, that whole idea of legitimacy and, 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 and the um, a force of custom, I think those two things have to be separated. Now, the revival of custom comes in an entirely different um, uh, way in the sense that um, it, it comes with globalization, it comes with internationalization, it, it comes with transnationalization, it comes with maybe the revival of the modern law merchant, where uh, we start talking about law operating in a legal order which is not statist, or where the state must recede, where international transactions uh, become of such a size and the international flow becomes that strong that it is no longer maintainable that all law is nationalized and all law is domestic, that all law is made by states and only by states, and there is nothing else left. And we see that in the international marketplace. Um, it, it, it never disappeared entirely, even though commercial law, of course, was also codified and also nationalized. Uh, in the international marketplace, I think it was never complete. Um, and there, I think, we, we have to make another um, uh, observation. Um, the a customary law is usually perceived as a question of contract. It is usually perceived as a uh, default rule which can be set aside by the parties very easily and uh, therefore maybe it's not so important because contract, if contract was wise, would take care of all those things. The force of custom is not at all in contract. The force of custom is in property. And I do not talk about land, I talk about personal property, uh, uh, chattels, intangible assets, uh, merchandise, uh, commodities, financial products. And there we see that, in truth, the, uh, the, the customary law is mandatory, and absolutely mandatory. Uh, and there are many, many examples of that. Uh, the hague visby rules, long before it became uh, a treaty law, were considered to be mandatory. That is the Bill of Lading. Uh, the um, international negotiable instruments, like the international bonds, nowadays, of course, the euro bond, is a, a, a supposed to be and has always operated under an international regime. Uh, even now, it is basically all entitlements, and we do not have paper anymore, uh, 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 negotiable instruments or promissory notes. Uh, the nature of it has not changed. Uh, if we look at the law of assignment of uh, receivables in an international assignment, uh, or if we look at the law of set-off, um, these are all areas where um, a custom has an enormous impact. It underpins the international markets. They could not operate with that. And this has, I think, always been so in the 19th century and the 20th century, but with the enormous increase in flows, and especially with the enormous increase in the importance of the international markets, we see that much more clearly. In fact, last night, uh, flying from Berkeley here, uh, I was reading a PhD, um, a thesis of one of my Chinese students on the operation <coughs> of clearing and settlement in, um, in the international financial system. A terrible technical and difficult thing. I mean, quite a lot of problems with it. But uh, it's a very good thesis. And, the, and there again, you see that the whole international clearing and settlement um, could not work without this <coughs> enormous undercurrent of commercial custom that really is the only thing that keeps it together. Uh, the whole thing would collapse without, never mind what doctrinaire domestic infested and, and educated lawyers like to think about the law of custom. So custom is not a contractual thing really, I mean it's also a contract, but it is really, its true force is in the international marketplace, it is in 
proprietary and the proprietary issues um, that um, that make this world work. And um, and, 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 and that is, I think, very clear, I think, not only for, for, for insiders, but, uh, of course, I, I'm a banker in origin, but, I mean, the, so the, this world is, of course, very live uh, to me, but, uh, and it is hidden from many uh, better mortals than bankers, but um, it, is, uh, it is undoubtedly crucial, and it is the oil in the machine. Now, what is that oil? Really, that the uh, uh, default rule is normality. What is normal in life? And that is really the, 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 the underlying issue in all custom, that the default rule is always what, in the end, do we find or the participants find that is normal in their business, how normal people behave. Of course, you can do it differently if you say so, but uh, that is the key and that is the expectation. It is in the routine. It is how we do things. And, and there's nothing more grandiose to custom than that, but it is immensely important. Now, as I said, it is in the international markets, it's in the context of the uh, revival of the modern law merchant that it works. But we have to understand that a custom of this nature, important as it is, is not the only source of law. There are many others. And so ultimately, also in the revival of the law merchant, the key issue is what are the sources of law? What do we have? Now, we have custom, um, uh, 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 directory and mandatory, uh, but we have many other things. I mean, we have fundamental custom, of a, of a fundamental principle. I mean, the, the whole uh, uh, Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice only mentions a few. It only mentions the Pacta Sunt Servanda. That is, of course, really only a fundamental uh, principle of uh, contract law. But uh, there are proprietary principles the whole idea that we can own things, that is a fundamental principle, the, the whole idea of mine and thine, the idea that we are responsible for our own acts as the uh, principle of the uh, law of negligence, uh, that we must give back what is not ours, the whole principle of the uh, uh, law of unjust enrichment. And in fact, uh, this whole list is in uh, the uh, Grotius second part of the Jura Pachis. You can, you know, there's nothing new here. Uh, there are five, six, or seven very fundamental principles around which we dance. I mean, they, they are use cogens. They are absolutely fundamental to the whole system. But then we have custom. We have, uh, uh, of course, treaty law, even private law. I mean, the Vienna Convention on the International Sale of Goods is an important example of this. Uh, we have general principle. Now, general principle and fundamental principle is not at all the same. General, general principle and custom is not at all the same. Uh, of course, in a public international law, we talk about general principle as the law of all civilized nations, if one still dares to say that. Or the law of modern commercial states, a kind of common denominator on which all these European contract principles seem to be based. Um, we have party autonomy as an autonomous source of law. And we can line them up. There's a hierarchy there. I've always said that the key of the modern Lex Mercatoria is not a system of law. It is a hierarchy of sources of law. And if we cannot, in private law, uh, get to a solution with these various sources which we line up, according to in the hierarchy, if, 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 if we're still not there, then we will rely on a domestic law. We will go back through the rules of private international law to find a domestic system that will supplement all of this. Uh, that is and remains, I think, the residual rule. Uh, and it doesn't do any harm at all as long as we understand that that residual rule will get smaller and smaller and all the international uh, sources of law likely to get bigger and bigger. And that is private law. And then also we have, of course, uh, to calculate in the uh, question of public regulatory domestic law where uh, domestic governments declare an interest. That is outside all of this, not private law at all. It's a question of competition of one legal order against the other. And there it is what the Americans call uh, the jurisdiction to prescribe. And uh, for governments that can claim <coughs> justifiably an interest in an international transaction, well, arbitrators and courts will have to weigh uh, the, uh, the, uh, how, how strong that interest is and if it is strong enough, if there's conduct and effect on uh, the, uh, st uh, the territory of the state uh, uh, involved, then one must admit 
that that state may have an overriding interest also in an international transaction. And that is all there is to it. That is how I, as an arbitrator, operate. Uh, mind you, I do not write dissertations in my awards. I will simply say I have listened, <laughs> I have listened to the parties and I find that the law is. Let them figure out how I got there, right? And I will certainly not use a language in terms of sources of law or, you know, lex mercatoria, rather avoid it, or uh, uh, certainly not private international law. Um, I, I will just, you know, I'll just say what, what it is. If I can convince my, 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 my wing arbitrators, and if I sit alone, then I, indeed, I can say whatever I like. But it, it has to make some sense. So the, um, <laughs> but this is the background to it. Yes, I, I think I should stop. And this is really as much as I can remember of my paper. <laughs> that is all there is. <laughs> That's all there is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm sure there must be some questions and reactions after these two wonderful presentations. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the problems with enforcement on even domestic issues, and I think the example that you gave um, with some of the custom, the customary laws actually becoming laws was in Kenya with the female genital mutilation. Yes, right. They have trouble actually enforcing those laws even though they've passed a strong women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, am I right to say that you were sort of suggesting that um, an international treaty or some sort of larger body could help enforce customary international law um, but what suggests that those those types of remedies might actually be um, might actually help or work or be acknowledged by the public and does that matter I mean how much does the government in a particular state enforcing a norm you know matter when you're trying to sort of carry out these larger treaty or international norms on a public level or for you know the inner the, the individual I'm actually arguing more for treaty regimes and diminishing of customary international law. I wouldn't particularly like to see, uh, via treaty, the enforcement of custom, unless it became a treaty norm. Uh, and you're quite right. I do see uh, tremendous difficulties in enforcing a treaty norm as well. Uh, that's why I prefer market-based approaches where it's possible. Um, in some kinds of human rights situations where there's ambigu ambiguity about um, local culture, I would prefer a more decentralized approach as opposed to a, a centralized approach. Otherwise, you're not going to have pluralism in the world. Uh, and that's, to me, that, to some degree, that's the imperial pro uh, project. And do you right. see that that actually has an effect on sort of the individual person or the common person, that those decentralized um, programs are actually better enforcement mechanisms all the way across, even though there are, you know, there can be issues sort of domestically. Well, it may be the only way of enforcement. I mean, the international human rights are not enforced. There's not a, there was a committee, in, uh, I guess a commission, human rights commission, that uh, receive r reports and occasionally um, publishes something that's negative, but the only technique is embarrassment. Yes, sir. Professor Brower. Thank you. Um, also a question for Professor Kelly. I, I, I was interested, of course, I, I take your objection to one of your objections being the use of custom uh, to implement some sort of natural policy, which ever happens to be the particular policy perspective, whether it is a human rights perspective or a democratization perspective or whatever. And you advocate treaties as a more democratic way of um, articulating right. principles. Exactly. Now, of course, when you get 100 or 150 states together with very different interests, the only way to arrive at a, uh, an agreed statement is often at a very high level of generality or ambiguity, uh, which leaves enormous room for interpretation mm -hmm. to figure out what is fair and equitable treatment, what is cruel and unusual uh, or, or cruel degrading in treatment or punishment. And then that leaves essentially to the decision maker, the adjudicator, if you have one, the specification of what the obligations are um, and, and what's to prevent then from the same sort of policy-driven interpretation coming in through just the, the interpretive mechanism as opposed to how one defines custom. Well, I think that's exactly right, and it does happen, obviously, at the WTO in the Shrimp Sea Turtle case. It, it, it certainly does happen. Um, I think it's a, in the human rights area, it's a statement that nations are not yet ready to define norms with great clarity. 
and you do pose an adjudicator, but there are very few adjudications that are involved in the human rights area. Uh, that's why the Alien Torts Claim situation is such an interesting one. It's a domestic tribunal making decisions about international human rights. Uh, I think it's an area that has some value. I'm not against it. I, I kind of like the social decision, actually, because it seems to me they tried to narrow the kinds of customary norms that could be used as a cause of action in U.S. courts. And I think that's the way to go. Thank you. But that doesn't answer my question about the treaty so much, uh, which is obviously the SOSA is mostly going to be based on customary norms, but, but I am interested in the treaty aspect of if you have the problem with these policy-driven uh, um, <coughs> norms, I, I'm not sure that treaty is the answer because you're going to get the statements at the very high level of ambiguity, which opens up the sure. process to the same difficulties as well, before. Well, I, was, I guess uh, what I was trying to say is that in the human rights area where this is... Um, not only possible, it's, uh, it's manifest. Uh, it's a statement by states that they do not want human rights enforced against them. That, that's why there's so few adjudications, and that's why it's, it's vague, I think. It's a lack of political will, if you will. Yes, Professor Moses. Yeah. Could I ask uh, another, professor for another question for Professor Kelly, and it's sort of following up on this. And, and my question is, I guess, in your view, uh, what went wrong? Because as I understand customary international law, the point of it was you simply survey the practice of states and you see what they are doing and whether they're doing it out of a sense of legal obligation, and that's it. It's very much a declarative enterprise. Now, I gather from you that actually what's happening is that people who are supposed to be looking around declaring what the custom is are actually importing their own transcendent values into things. And right, I guess right. my question is, is that because they are in some sense acting in bad faith, or is it because maybe in the nature of humanity, it's very easy to look around and see people are doing exactly what you think they should be doing, or, or what? Well, as my colleague said in the private area, it's about normality, right? What is normal in that sphere? In the private area, you're dealing with small homogenous groups. In the international sphere, you're dealing with people with very different values and interests. Um, I think it is the, 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 the key is values. Yes, as values versus uh, what? Money. What's useful in, in that very uh, s small if environment? Doing, if you're doing customary international law correctly and you look around and you see a diversity of values, you should simply say there's no custom, right? Exactly. That's, that's my point, is that there's a lack of normality and they're just, uh, in, in the books and with international jurists, that which is termed customary international law is the practice of a few right. for a temporary period of time. That tells us no nothing about general normals, normalcy. It tells us something about the specifics of a few countries. Maybe it's a regional custom in some circumstances. <coughs> if I could interject just with a question for Professor Dalhausen. Well, I'm, uh, not, I'm not a stroke. You're not a <laughs> stroke. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but I, I, I wondered if you could comment a little bit on the role of what private sector organizations in the private sphere, in the articulation, <coughs> and then how does custom change, and what do well, we do? This, yeah, this it's, it's a very key question, which I should have uh, uh, talked about, because it's, it's a large part of my paper. Uh, it is, of course, interesting to find in the commercial world, and that's why I limit this to the commercial world, not even that narrow, where money speaks, and that is, in terms of normalcy, a kind of an easy criteria. It, it sounds very uh, banal, but it is, you know, that, that is the way it is. So values do not enter into this very much, but we still have the problem that these customs must be found, um, and it is often not easy. Uh, they have to be proven, of course, in litigation. Uh, peer groups will come up and will, will testify. Uh, you can be sure that the other party will find another peer group that uh, testifies just as vehemently that it is all not done that way. Um, there is uncertainty. Um, also, it is to some extent retrospective. Uh, I maintain that uh, um, uh, custom uh, being the expression of normalcy can change overnight. Uh, the whole idea that custom is time immemorial and uh, is only valid if it has been around forever is a total misconception what all of this is. But even so, um, it is, uh, there, is an, uh, there is doubt. And, in, um, and this is where, of course, trade associations, or whatever you call it, come in in a major way. Uh, the International Chamber of Commerce is, of course, famous in this connection. It has formulated the INCO terms and the UCP for letters of credit, uh, which have been with, uh, with us now for 70, 80 years. 
and a dominate the field. Uh, they often considered to be contractual, but basically they are customary in that trade and have an enormous um, um, importance. Uh, but of course, it is very interesting. That's why the Germans always have problems with, with with this. It is interesting to see. Uh, that they have a motor in this. It is not just a reflection of the practice. They have a motor, or uh, I call it the spokesman function. They have people who can articulate and can at the same time move the whole scene further if uh, there is a need. Uh, you see the same in international capital markets. The International Primary Association, of which I was Secretary General at one stage, does do the same to articulate international custom or the customs of the trader, how we do it. But whilst doing so, it also moves it on. It makes it more rational, if you, if, if, if you wish. And, and it formulates, so that at least uh, in litigation we have something to hold on to. Um, and uh, so, uh, but it is, of course, you have to accept if... Uh, of, let, let, let's take a step back. Uh, Lisa Bernstein uh, in Chicago has attacked the whole attitude to custom and uniform commercial code and used trade unions to demonstrate that really they have taken over and that trade un of uh, tr trade associations, not trade unions, trade associations are uh, of a different, that is a, a different activity and that it, that is basically contractual and that that is not, has nothing to do with customary law. And I, I would deny that. In fact, uh, Epstein has slapped her down from her own <laughs> law school survey. I don't need to do that. But the, um, it is totally misconceived. But you, you have to understand, uh, if, if, if we accept that a uh, custom is dynamic and has to be and is dynamic in its very essence, then it is not so difficult to understand that trade associations um, uh, 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 have here a very important role. And... Um, and, and, and are indeed private legislators. You cannot say if you belong to that trade, I did not sit at the table. I, I, it's not the way I have done it. And now it is formulated by the industry or part of the industry that is from now onwards so and so. And you have to accept this unless in the contract you say that you don't want and you exclude yourself and guess what, before long you won't have a contract anymore. Right? So, um, the, uh, the, I'm grateful for this question, uh, but this motor function, I think, is, is a leg up from custom as we traditionally understand it. And this is maybe what in, the, what in your part of the world, what you kind of lack, because uh, you, you, of course, have treaties, but you do not have trade associations that kind of formulate things on a more informal basis. Well, there may be something that's akin to it. Okay. Right, it's not so much in the custom world, but in the treaty regimes. Yeah. Most treaty regimes in the environmental area Ozone, Laird, and a variety of other ones have a conference of parties, right? uh -huh. cops, and they meet every couple of years. And what they do is they get compliance reports, they monitor, and that becomes a basis to observe whether behavior is consistent with the, the treaty norms. Right. So. Uh, I saw Professor Carbono. Is, is there, in, in response to what you just described, is there a tension between uniform law like the Vienna Convention? <coughs> which is a highly litigious document. Once you start reading that, it's not a civil code at all. It's not a, a continental code. It is a US fabrication to encourage full employment among lawyers. So <laughs> you, you, have, you have a uniform code that is very difficult to understand. In fact, I find it impossible to teach. Well, uh, so, so do I. Yes. But, but, <laughs> but doesn't that eliminate custom because the preoccupation of the process will be with interpreting a written document rather than discovering what is standard practice in an area. Well, it, it, the, the, the Vienna Convention of 1980, that Vienna Convention on International, of course it started in 1928, not as an American project, but it, 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 it is much older. It was, uh, it, 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 it's a Rabels project, uh, Germany. Um, and uh, it, it has uh, come in, 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 in two uh, reincarnations, first the Hague Conventions and now we have the, uh, the Vienna Convention. It's only a partial codification. It, um, it, 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 it is an, a diplomatic success, but it is a practical failure because most businesses exclude it, as you well know. Uh, the, 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 the commercial practice has not been willing to accept it. Um, it is confused about the sources of law in, in the extreme. If you read Article 7, it doesn't make any sense at all. If you read Article 9 about 
practices and custom, you will see that is the, they are implied terms at best. If you read Article 4, well, then you see that it is uncertain about uh, sources of law, and um, the whole thing is not, uh, even though touted as an enormous success, it is, uh, it, it is old law. I mean, basically it was formulated in 1939. Uh, if you look at uh, section uh, two of uh, the or part of formation of contract, which still has this old-fashioned mating dance between the parties, it doesn't make any sense at all in, in, in long-term contract. It, it, it might be all right in the sale of a bicycle, but if you have a long-term sales contract, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, nevertheless, it's still, uh, uh, even in formation, often acceptance, it still serves as the model for most anything else. And there you see, in my view, and I have criticized, of course, enormously, I'm not a friend of that at all, uh, there you see the, um, uh, the, uh, the barrenness, if I may say so, of the intellectual community that, uh, that, that, that pushes that kind of thing. And uh, the, uh, that is why the European principles uh, um, uh, and the UNIDRA principles of contract law, that is 19th century thinking. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, and it should be forbidden. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but very peculiar to hear a European say something. Well, I have to say I'm a European, that remains to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> I can think. But the, uh, so we should not be, the, the, I hate to say it in this, in this, uh, in, in, in this group, but uh, the, um, what these grimy of academics, these committees, what they do and what they come up with is highly suspect. It has nothing to do with reality whatsoever. I mean, at least the Germans, when they made their big code in 1900, they had an idea of reality, never mind how mistaken. I mean, they tried to correct it, and uh, they, they see the law as an instrument to correct you know, the world. Uh, this is not something f legal practitioners and the commercial world has never asked for any of this, never. It is highly confused in its modern manifestation with consumer law. You see, even though the UNIDRA principles only apply to the commercial, to the professional dealings, it's pure consumer law. All the protections of consumers are in there. And it, that, that is a typical civil law idea, that what protects the one, since we think not in terms of relationship between the parties, but we think in, in the civil law in terms of the nature of contract, what is good for the one is also good for the yeah. other. We have never, and we will not, and I will say in the festival for uh, Lord Bingham, I, I will make a point of this, that the, it is absolutely <coughs> crucial that we separate in international unification, whether informally or formally, the consumer sphere from the professional sphere. These are two entirely different worlds. But is it, yeah. Isn't the bad statutory law better than the dictatorship of the arbitrator? The dictatorship of the arbitrator. No, no, but was, was, uh, was an arbitrator in, in Switzerland who said, uh, I don't care what law the parties choose, I don't care what that law says, it's, it's me who establishes the law, or it's I who establishes To that I say this, arbitrators have an enormous freedom, that is true, but we are not free. We must find a normativity outside ourselves. That is the bottom line. We cannot, and I mean it's very difficult, I mean it's difficult for all judges, but it is ultimately, we can just not say, I think, that's totally irrelevant. Of course, that is the underlying reality, but I mean, yes. don't for heaven's sake, don't say that. And, the, and it shouldn't be. <laughs> but in an, uh, in an legal environment which is uncertain, I think, yeah, as an arbitrator, you have to cobble it together. But was the old common law ever different? You see, there I would make another observation. It is entirely wrong to look at the operation of the law from the perspective of dispute resolutions. The law is the most imperfect at the level of dispute resolution. Now, the common law is based on this because we could only know the law through dispute resolutions and through cases. But, and, and there I think the civil law had some advantage because it looked at what law how it operated and what good <laughs> law was for society to make it work. Now, it has got off the rails there, too. But, I mean, the, uh, it, is, it is not right. The, uh, I would not uh, for a moment pretend that arbitration is a perfect art. But neither is the court. Neither. Yes. Nobody would litigate. I mean, the, if it was perfect, if it was certainty, there would be nothing to do for lawyers. Nothing. We would all be out of a job. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
we'll come to the time, but we have a few extra minutes. If, if you're all okay, we can cut the break down to, to five minutes and take a few more questions, if that's okay with the panel. Yes. Um, yeah, I actually had a question for you. You mentioned at the end of your remarks um, that a, an arbitrator is sometimes confronted with this question of prescriptive jurisdiction sure. and putting you in a position to assess the, the state interest. More and more. Um, and, in, competition in practice, cases. We have competition. Yeah. I can, so. and, and in practice, how do arbitrators really do this? And, and if so, how extensively? And what's the source of your authority to do that if your mandate is from two private parties? Well, the authority is, of course, uh, uh, first, the United States Supreme Court has allowed us to do this in the Mitsubishi mm -hmm. case, and so yeah. has the European Court in the Echo Suisse case. So where it is said that we must, whether we like it or not, on our own motion, you know, take these things into account. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, then this is subject to a challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, so whether we like it or not, we have to. Now, it is true that old-fashioned arbitrators hate this. I happen to love it. I, I think it's wonderful. I teach the course on uh, you know, uh, international litigation in the American courts. I mean, the jurisdiction to prescribe all these cases. I think they are wonderful cases. I mean, I hate cases, but those cases are. And uh, so the, that is our authority. It is, it is not that the Supreme Court of the United States or the European Court is our authority, but they have recognized our authority. It's a question of, of recognition, I think. And then also imposing on us the duty. So um, we must. Now, how far does this go? I mean, uh, uh, you know, even in the United States, uh, domestic courts uh, uh, are being faced with international cases. I mean, the jurisdiction to prescribe is a difficult issue. And, um, you know, if the case moves farther and farther away from the United States, there comes a moment that we cannot enforce the competition law extraterritorially anymore either. I mean, this is a question of appreciation. But it is no different, I think, for arbitrators than it is for uh, ordinary court, courts, except the traditional arbitrators hate this. They hate even uh, negligence aspects. The arbitrators basically are educated in the field of contract, uh, proprietary issues. I, I now get them in, uh, in uh, international finance. International finance was on the whole not arbitrated until the banks found out that courts are even more dangerous. And uh, uh, so we now see uh, uh, banking cases, uh, the international capital market cases in arbitration. Not many, but I mean, they, they are coming. And there, uh, yes, we, we, we deal with property issues. Property issues are mandatory. Now, I've talked about international custom in property, but I mean, th these are mandatory issues which we have to decide. These are all, in common law terminology, equitable interests, of which the, co the civil law knows nothing. And, and, and how they work, it's often very hard to explain to, you know, fellow arbitrators, and there is tension in about, and there is tension on public policy issues, but these are all mandatory law issues, which I think when they come on our plate, we just have to decide on whether we like it or not. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Professor Knopf. I wanted to ask um, Ralph Michael's first question to both of you, because I think you spoke a little bit about it in passing, but maybe, maybe I could just put it directly. What does private international law have to teach public international law about custom and vice versa? Uh, both of you, obviously. <laughs> well, maybe I'm prejudiced about that. I, I very much enjoyed the presentation. It, s it seems to me the definitions are quite similar. It's just in public international law, you're dealing with highly charged political value issues. Uh, you're dealing with a very large a large community that's heterogeneous, heter has heterogeneity. Uh, it's easier for me to pronounce. And the result of that is you're unlikely to get normalcy. That is, you're unlikely to get a real agreement on, uh, implicit agreement on what those norms are. Whereas in the private sphere, you're dealing with a, a relatively small uh, group, financial group, uh, or banking group that is used to dealing with each other. They have one particular focus. Um, they're much more willing to, to find something that works in that small environment. Um. Well, it is, yes, the, in private law transnationalization, I think there we manage to push out the state altogether. And so the whole claim of the state that it is the fountain of all law, including uh, private law, that cannot obtain in the world of international finance. I mean, we are beyond borders, whether you like it or not. Many people think it's totally immoral, but I mean, that is the way it is. Whilst, of course, 
on your side. Mm -hmm. I mean, the states are there, and uh, they, they remain actors. In, and, and dominant actors also in the formulation of a customary law. And if they don't like it, or if they don't want it, there is not an other wheel, as there is in international finance, that confines them. So if we look at a, a public law um, a custom uh, reigning in states, well, you know, they can defend. If you believe in the absolute supremacy, an absolutist idea of sovereignty, well, in private law, it goes beyond them, unless they would, by international treaty, you know, a, a, a kill the Lex America to I suspect they could, if, 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 if all of them agree, but they'll never agree all of them. And, uh, and then the international market will move to those who don't agree, right? Um, dreadful. The, uh, so, but in, in, in public law, you know, the supremacy of states, if they claim that, if they think there are no values that counterbalance that, not in, well, uh, fundamental principle or in international custom well then you know then you have a problem because you you are still you know in their world you don't have a way out because i thought i heard professor kelly saying that there was something additional you could take from private international law which is what you called the market based approach yes to norm formation so there's also a solution that you might take from Oh, private international law. I think you're exactly right. And I, it's kind of paradoxical. I mean, the way that the state gets pushed out in public international law is through treaty regimes, because what they're trying to do is facilitate private behavior. And the extent to which you're e either facilitating private behavior or setting up market tools to achieve your ends, that pushes the state out, which reduces the, the, right. the possibilities of politics and, and value interference with the, the regime. So private international law is ahead of the game. Well, probably. For you. That's okay. You are a little freer. Right. If you call that the head of the, the, head of the game. Right. Yes. Oh, Professor <laughs> Kelly does, I think. <laughs> Professor Dodge. Let's just, um, just a brief observation. Let's not overstate the extent to which the market works in private international law, though, because the example of the UCP, I think, is a good one. I mean, the UCP doesn't reflect the values of the whole community. The UCP reflects the values of the banks. Um, and it's very bank protective. And so you have this sort of do the documents appear on their face to comply um, standard, which makes no allowance for fraud, fraudulent or forged documents. The exception for fraud is then created by judicial decision, then incorporated through uh, legislation in the UCC. So you get a sort of pushback, a limitation on the custom um, through, I, th I would argue, to correct market failure and a, an underrepresentation of the interests of some of the participants, uh, the applicants uh, and the beneficiaries in, of letters of credit, um, to correct this market failure. But it's a pushback that actually comes from the state. So I think there's a the, there's a, a dialogue that goes on here. Um, it's not all yeah, it's in the, custom. It, it, yes, it's, but it's in the margin. I mean, the uh, the it's not true that it's only for banks. I mean, because the private parties enormously rely the beneficiaries on the on the. Uh, back up in the UCP. Um, uh, I have a long footnote on this, if that may reassure you or not, uh, on how indeed the French, the English, and the Dutch courts and the German courts have reacted to the UCP and all accepted as commercial practice. That's basically what it is. And uh, of course, the UCC, and that also goes for the INCO terms, the UCC has its own regime. But uh, you well know that uh, Article 5, when it was redrafted, basically was uh, redrafted in harmony with the UCP. And uh, the INCO terms exactly the same. Uh, art article 2, you have, of course, the CIV and the FOP and, and, and a number of others. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the INCO terms and the UCP are considered to be internationally normative, <coughs> and even those who want to draft legislation will usually use it as their model. My point is just that in codifying, you know, there are things that are added to. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and that there, there's a, a, a process of dialogue. It's not, we haven't completely delegated the formation of these norms no, to but private of course groups. The, the, yes, but the UCP is also, I mean, it only obtains in, in the, between the states, of the, in, the, in the states of the United States, or to some extent in between the states. But we talk here about the international uh, uh, financial commercial practice, where I think even Americans would on the whole not deny that in the international dealings, the UCP and uh, the Inca terms are normative. Now, I think your point is equally relevant in the public international sphere, because if, if you want to set up a, a cap-and-trade and other market-based uh, situations, 
who's going to decide what the cap is? I mean, that's a state decision, and that state uh, that decision is based on values that has enormous impacts on the cost of producers. Um, it's going to have an impact on the extent to which uh, greenhouse gases are reduced, and that's ultimately a, a state decision. Okay. On that note, let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.